Good evening. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us for another episode of Civically Speaking, Art as a Political Activator this evening, co-presented by the American Repertory Theater and the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm Ryan McKittrick. I'm the ART's Director of Artistic Programs and Dramaturg. I am a white man with brown hair, and I'm wearing a blue shirt and a gray jacket and sitting in an office here at the American Repertory Theater, where we have our second preview performance of 1776 starting in just about a half hour this evening. I'm really excited for this evening's conversation, uh, but before we begin, I have a few Zoom housekeeping notes for everyone. First, please note that the Zoom chat is disabled and it will be continue to be disabled throughout the conversation. Second, I wanted to share that captions auto-generated by Zoom are available for those who want or need them. You can turn them on by pressing a button labeled live transcript or more at the bottom right of your Zoom screen and selecting show transcript or show, show subtitles, all depending on how recently you've updated your Zoom. Third, we'll reserve the last 15 minutes or so of the hour for Q&A with our speakers. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the, con during the conversation using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You don't need to wait to the, until the last 15 minutes to do that. You can do that at any time. Uh, a few more notes before we begin. First, I would like to acknowledge that the Loeb Drama Center, where I am zooming in from this evening, is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusett, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusett tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusett people. Next, I'd like to lift up ART's commitment to anti-racism. ART is unequivocally opposed to hate and centers anti-racism as a core value. We expect everyone in the ART community, including our audiences, to uphold these values. And as such, we will not tolerate anti-Blackness or racism of any kind in our buildings nor at our offsite events. We aim to create an environment that is uninhabitable to racism and discrimination and where all BIPOC staff, artists, volunteers, audience, and community are seen, heard, valued and provided the opportunity to thrive. This work is only possible when we do it together. Thank you for being our partner in it. And now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's conversation, um, which we're hosting in connection with ART's revival production of the musical 1776 that just went into its first preview performance last night. We have another dynamic discussion planned for next week with Harvard professors, Timothy Patrick McCarthy, Danielle Allen and Vincent Brown, who will be talking about the promises and predicaments of 1776. And we'll drop a link to that event webpage in the chat. We're gonna begin this evening's event by sharing a music video made by Mississippi Votes titled The Future, an inspirational song by BDE music group recording artist Dollar Black to remind young people that every election cycle is important. After the video, our moderator for this evening, Asia Upchurch, who is an artist, instructor, and an education consultant committed to youth advocacy, social inclusion, artistry development, and transformative education, and who is also a lecturer on education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, will join us to introduce our panelists and get the conversation going. I'll then rejoin the conversation to help with the Q&A for the last 15 minutes. So see you then, and now, the future.
us. Great, and I'd like to welcome Aisha Upchurch. Hi, Aisha. Hi, Ryan. Hi. How are you? I will go off camera. Thanks, Ryan. Um, well, that certainly was the best way to get this year party started. Good evening or whatever time of day it is for folks. Um, my name is Aisha Upchurch, and I'm extremely honored and excited to get the opportunity to act as a as a moderator for this discussion um, and before introducing our amazing panelists uh, i just want to invite everybody um one thing about the work that i do and about the work of this work is that it all takes up residence in our bodies that policies and practices are not these things that are floating above our heads in the crowd in the clouds but they actually exist they get memorized, they get replicated, they become policy because of things that happen in and through the body. So I wanna invite everybody just to do a little body scan because here we are for those joining us in synchronous timing on a Wednesday, May 18th, very full acknowledgement that the assault on bodies of color in this country continue and that we're still living in a global health pandemic that has continued to morph. So with all of those things and the topics that we're gonna start um, approach today, just wanna acknowledge that sometimes we might have some feels. It's Wednesday. I don't know if you did the Humpty Dance yet or not, but let's just take a moment to like be in our bodies intentionally. So I'm gonna invite everybody to take a breath in, just acknowledging that we are here and hold it for four counts. So you're gonna take a breath in and hold it for one, two, three, Four, release with more grace and gratitude that however you are making it, you are making it, you here. Um, so again, it's very exciting for me that we got to kick off this conversation with that video um, as someone who thinks about this work also in terms of, in, in terms of embodiment. Um, I also think of it in terms of arts education and more specifically hip hop education, knowing that hip hop is many things. And one of those things is a powerful language and lens of being and existing and connecting. So there's so much richness happening and we are gonna be graced today to talk with someone from the organization behind that amazing piece of work. Um, and I think this conversation is really important regardless of what sandbox any of us are in. I say that I'm a seed planter and a soil agitator and a curious and passionate artist educator, right? So it's not about the brick and mortar building. It's not about the title and the position. It's about everywhere that we are called and we have people. I would like to say that we all can be doing the work of advocacy, of activism and artivism, if you've got that in your bag. Um, because as I believe, and my mantra is, we gotta be dope. We gotta be dismantling oppression and pushing education. And that doesn't have to deal with the site and the place of a building or an institution. But wherever we're called, there's work that we can lean on and our artistic crafts and all of our experiences to really think about how the future is being shaped right now. So I'm so excited to be able to introduce panelists who are exemplifying the type of artivism and um, organizing that is really at the heart of what's going to keep us moving forward. So um, I'm not saying I am a hip hop head, but I'm not saying that I'm not. So the first person I'm going to introduce is going to be, I'm going to, Pull, go into my Queen Latifah space because we're gonna go, ooh, the ladies first, the ladies first. So I'm gonna introduce Arika Bennett, who is a community organizer from the Deep South, whose interests lie at the intersection of LGBTQ plus issues, Black feminism and voting rights. And she is the executive director of Mississippi Votes. So go ahead and put your Zoom hands and emojis together to welcome Arika Bennett to our discussion. 
Um, so our next person who's going to be joining this conversation, I got to always shout out people who rep in the Midwest because I'm a St. Louis girl, the Midwest to our DIE. Uh, but Princess Haney is a veteran community organizer and strategist who has trained hundreds of leaders in grassroots organizing, leading racial justice, criminal justice, and higher education campaigns across the state of Ohio, where he is the executive co-executive director of the Ohio Organizing Collective. So cue your virtual air horns. Where, 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 where Ohio is in the building with us tonight. And lastly, we have Jasiri X, who is an award-winning Pittsburgh-based rapper and activist and the co-founder of One Hood Media, which is an intergenerational, intersectional community collective that is dedicated to raising and, and, and supporting socially conscious artists and activists who utilize art as a means of raising awareness about social justice matters affecting people around the world. So I'm going to welcome all of our panelists to the screen. And even though like the chat is disabled, listen, I'm also Pentecostal. So testify, we need to feel that energy through the Zoom screen that you are here. Yeah, yeah, there we go. There we go that you are here with us. Okay, so let me change my view so I can see everyone. Um, and I'm not sure if we're able to pin our, or spotlight our, um, our panelists, but if we're able to do that, I hope that that would facilitate folks being able to see everyone. Um, and in lieu of that, I encourage everyone to turn on your gallery view so you can just see this, this whole buffet of beauty and excellence that is the panel tonight. Um, I'm happy to be with you all. How y'all feeling tonight? How we doing? How we doing? Pretty good. Come on, Pretty buffet. Good. <laughs> the buffet of blackness. I just love it. Okay, there it has to be okay. said. Yeah, he didn't I said it. Boom, cack, shackalack. Oh, by the way, I should say, um, I do my audio description and I'll allow our panelists to um, also do an audio description as we get to the first question. Um, but I am a dark brown skinned black woman wearing a multicolored head wrap with long locks and a red t-shirt. And I'm sitting in an office with the waning sunlight kissing my cheek. Um, so just wanna paint the vibes for everyone. So listen, we're gonna do this. We're gonna try to bring in the ethos of a cipher or double Dutch ropes. If you feel like you got the energy and you wanna jump in, I'm not, I'm not someone who does a lot of formal hand calling. So I'm gonna put this first question out and we would love to hear from all of you all. And the first question is kind of a tag team, won't well, there it is type of dupe two and one is what led you to this whole path of art as a strategy for activism? And why do you believe that it can be, artivism can be so impactful? Hip Hop Harry wants to know who's next. I'll go. <laughs> Good job. Okay. Um, so I am a black, a dark brown girl with a Southern draw, um, with an orange shirt, um, some beautiful red lipstick and some golden braids. Okay, period. Um, <laughs> but no, um, art has always been a form of resistance for black people and has always been used to politicize and move folks. Um, what we're doing at Mississippi Votes isn't any different than the humming of um, directions in Negro spirituals, uh, Nina Simone's Mississippi Goddamn or Billy, Billy Holiday's Strange Fruit. Um, there's always been movement tools in art form, always. And I can't count the amount of politically charged pieces of poetry and spoken word that have moved me or books and art pieces in local galleries that have made me think deeply about my existence and my place in the world. Um, but during the height of the pandemic, for sure, the world turned to art. I think I read that somewhere on Instagram, remember in our darkest moments, we turned to artists. Um, and I was thinking like, how true is that? Um, and if I think about 2020 more in depth, particularly in my organization's context, we didn't see how we could move people without art. So we began to host events with DJs, um, painting sips that featured local artists. So like they'd sketch something political and folks would also be engaged in conversation about the census or 
the opportunity to change our state's flag. Um, and it became more and more apparent that it that art was essential to our cultural work and the movement we were building. Um, so Hannah, who's our policy lead, and Velvet, who's our programs director, we all sat down and we decided to find a local artist um, to give us a message of hope. And that's the video that you saw from Dollar Black. Um, so shout out to Dollar Black and BDE um, for trusting Hannah VNI and, and bringing this together like super beautifully. Um, we became the center of something way bigger than us, right? Like we couldn't imagine becoming the political home of thousands of organizers at the up during the uprising of, um, you know, after George Floyd was murdered and after a lot of local things were happening. So I don't know if y'all know a lot about what was happening in Mississippi in 2020, but we were also in our own version of a pandemic. Um, but, you know, that video for sure was, um, you know, we have a lot of political education pieces on our website, on our YouTube channel, but that particular video was um, 10,000 views in within the first 10 hours of its release. So like, <laughs> it just showed us um, that the power of, of art and even, even on through the election cycle, we would go to college campuses to do voter registration or voter engagement. And they would like be screaming, largest youth engagement since 1964. And we were like, whoa, right? Like, and that solidified for us that, you know, not only were we becoming people's political home, but people were able to see themselves in the larger narrative of freedom struggle in Mississippi. I love that. I love that, Rika. You, you said so much that um, that just resonated with me. You know, we um, not only do we have blood because we're um, both from Mississippi, from you know, ancestrally Hollis Springs, but also um, me growing up as a, a black boy, you know, with locks, brown skin, with a peach shirt and a white shirt from Ohio, in a deindustrialized city. You know, only forty miles from here, he, um, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and the young activists of Mississippi came up to uh, what was what is now Miami University to study nonviolent resistance and how to do voter registration to get people ready to go. And unfortunately, three of those young people were killed who head down to actually fight for a right to vote that year. So there's a long history between Ohio and Mississippi in that struggle with young people being politically activated to fight. But a little bit about me, Prentice Haney, the co-executive director of the Ohio um, Organizing Collaborative, how I got into art activism and art as a political activator is that, you know, I actually started off before I became a community organizer over a decade ago as an artist. You know, my first step into an artist was really to tell the story of my grief and my grandmother passing. I, you know, I wanted to honor her story and her legacy through writing. And through writing, I found filmmaking in, in the visual medium of telling stories. And as I was telling stories and making short films and figuring out how I wanted to be the next Spike Lee in life, my mother was figuring out how to keep our house through the sort of housing crisis. And my grandmother was trying to figure out how to keep two, two, um, two grandchildren, great-grandchildren actually, that she had been raising for a number of years but didn't have the resources to keep them. And then they went into foster care. And I, as an artist at that time, felt like I didn't have the tools to deal with that and something was wrong with my family. I internalized the sort of impression that was happening that something was wrong with my family. But it, I quickly realized through community organizing, political activation, that there was people in Columbus, Ohio, at our state capitol and people in Washington, DC, who were making decisions about our lives without thinking about people like myself and my mother and my grandmother and what they do to make black children's lives better every day. And so at that particular point, I became a community organizer because I knew that cultivating an agency and human, human dignity in people was the key to collective action. But something was missing in that. About six years in, I started to feel the energy of, of the songs and movements, especially as sort of Black Lives Matter, the first wave of Black Lives Matter after the killing of Trayvon Martin started to build back up. And the thing that started ringing in my head is like, why did we stop singing in our movement? And what, 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 why are we not bringing the sort of cultural um, relevance back into it? And, and I got involved in a, um, in a campaign that ended up becoming an organization called the Midwest Culture Lab, where um, we were bringing young artists and organizers together to figure out how we actually leverage culture as a way to be a political activator. Because what we know 
is that culture, because we know that politics is where some people are some of the time, but culture is where people are all the time. And so we were let we were letting a major part of especially how young black people experience the world off the table and not leveraging that for the sort of power we need in our communities. So reason why I believe in art activism and what I've experienced in, ter in terms of the transformation is that, and I ain't gonna get too deep around this, in this political project called democracy, it has always been an experiment. And when we say we're trying to make a more perfect union, it's the people like us on this call, black folks, queer folks, young folks, who have always been in the role of making a more perfect union through their imaginations of a democracy that never included any of us. And so how did that first manifest itself? It manifests itself through resistance in song, resistance in song and in food and in deciding that communities could act together and love together. Those imaginations became policies Policies just like, you know, um, over 60 years ago, Brown versus Board of Education, the 50th anniversary of that landmark case was yesterday. That was an imagination of a person who believed something that could be different to cultural, cultural movement. And so in today's society, what I was mostly interested in and have tested over the years is that how do we actually pay attention to the development of artist culture at the local level, millions of artists, and cultivate their voice and agency and have them go out into the world and bring their audiences along on a journey of transformation. Because actually democracy is, a, is, is actually, what makes it so revolutionary is that it actually starts in each person. And artists create a sort of revolutionary spark in people. And if we can cultivate that energy where young folks believe they can do something together and all people believe that they can change the world together, then we can use the things we know, such as political strategy and voter registration and all those pieces to actually act on those values. And so that's, that's what got me into it. And that's why I know today that when we bring artists together, we cultivate their sense of agency and belonging in the world. It not only transforms what they believe about themselves and what the story they believe about what they could do in a society, what they then put out as cultural artifacts in the world, changes the people who engage in it and what they believe about what they can do in the world. That is the key ingredient to transformation. And it is absolutely vital for a healthy democracy. And Black folks just know how to do it well. <laughs> and then there's that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, peace, y'all. Um, my name is Asiri X. Um, lighter skinned brother uh, with, a, with, a, with a fade, some semi high top, you know what I mean? Um, you know, tan shirt on, uh, representing Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, you know, I did, I did want to start with just a shout out to Mississippi. I, I've been to Mississippi one time and it was a, it was a very transformational uh, trip because I was able to be at Jackson State with two people that really influenced me as a, um, you know, artist and as an activist. Uh, one, may you rest in power, was Chokwe Lumumba, um, who was running for um, mayor at that time and came to speak uh, before a panel. And then another person that I was uh, blessed to meet and, and become friends with at that time was my brother, David Banner. So um, shout out to Mississippi, you know, um, and, and, that, and, the, and the people, man, so rooted in in the spirit and in, in resistance. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I got into art. I mean, I'm, I feel like, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of the hip hop generation. And so, you know, hip hop politicized me, my, my music and art politicized me, right? My mother named me Jasiri, that's my given name. And she raised me to be socially conscious. Uh, my name is Swahili, um, but it was like hip hop made it cool, you know, to be conscious. And so it was like, you know, artists like Nas and Wu-Tang and Lauryn Hill and Outkast, you know, that really kind of sparked my consciousness and, 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 and directed me to Public Enemy and KRS-One and Rakim and Latifah, you know. So, you know, for me, like, and I'm, I'm somebody that was, you know, spent the first part of my, uh, my childhood in the south side of Chicago, but moved to a suburb of Pittsburgh called Moroville. So I went from, like, 100% black environment to almost a 100% white environment. It was like hip hop that really helped me to 
um, keep my culture, keep my blackness, you know what I'm saying? And, and gave me um, that expression. And so when we began to organize, we wanted to use hip hop and the culture to organize with um, in Pittsburgh. You know, this is why we called our organization One Hood because we wanted we wanted it to resonate with like the, the young people in our community, right? You know what I'm saying? And we, and so it was it was all hip hop, and it wasn't that we, you know, um, felt you know like it wasn't like we were trying to disrespect the, the the older organizers, but we wanted to come in with that culture, and so I was a you know, I was actually kind of like a retired artist, <laughs> hip hop artist. And the reason when I, when we started organizing One Hood, I, I kind of was retired because people kept telling me people in my community didn't want to hear socially conscious music. And so I kind of felt like, OK, well, obviously, you know, that was the type of music that I wanted to do. And if people didn't want to hear it, um, I didn't want to try to do I, I didn't want to try to do music just to try to sell you know, I, I wanted to represent, you know, myself and I wanted to be authentic in my expression of art. So I was doing it kind of myself, but I didn't really have an idea of like, I'm going to do this as a career. And um, I happened to hear about a situation um, um, in Gina, Louisiana, where six young black men were um, charged with attempted murder for a fight in high school. It was the Gina Six. And so this was like, this was really like one of the first times it was like, we started to use social media to organize. And so... I didn't have any money to lend. So I said, you know, I'm gonna write a song about this. And I put it, it used to be this social media site back in the day, y'all called MySpace. I don't know if y'all <laughs> remember MySpace, you know what I'm saying? People, we kind of, we kind of would like MySpace back now. You know what I'm saying? It seemed like a, a simpler time. Uh, so I put the song uh, Free to Gina Six on MySpace. And next thing I know, it was being played all over the country. Um, and it was like, it kind of became the theme song of this Gen Six movement, and what was powerful about, you know. So then I'm then I'm with fifty thousand people in Gen Louisiana, mostly young black people, right? High school and college age black people, everybody wearing black, and you know, my song kind of became this theme song for the movement, and it was a victory, right? We were able to get the charges dropped against the Gen Six. Michael Bell, who got ahead a ten year prison sentence, like got freed. He's a lawyer now, you know. And so, um, but, and, and for me personally, I, it was like, yo, I was lied to. Like they told me that my generation didn't want to hear socially conscious music. And so, you know, I was, I was off, you know, um, kind of as a, a socially conscious artist. And I, I remember, um, you know, something happened in New York city with a young brother named Sean Bell, who was, you know, killed the day before his um, wedding by police. And those officers were found not guilty. And people started to hit my MySpace page, like, are you going to do a song about this? And I, I remember thinking, like, for a second, I was kind of like, well, I don't want to be like the tragedy rapper. Like, I don't want to be the dude that only came in when something bad happened. But at that time, um, mainstream artists wasn't really dealing with these issues. So I wrote a song about it, put a video together that also, you know, got a lot of attention. I was one of the I was the first artist to do something around Oscar Grant first artist to do a song uh, around Trayvon Martin. In fact, um, when I did the song about Trayvon Martin, um, it was in collaboration with an organization called Color of Change. And I remember, you know, putting the video together and calling Rashad Robinson and saying, hey, I got a video. We'd li I like to put it out with the petition because at that time we we're just trying to get George Zimmerman arrested. And so for me, you know, I really kind of became a movement artist, right? And I was blessed to be able to spend time with um, and be a part of an organization started by Harry Belafonte called the Gathering for Justice and really sit at the feet of, to me, the greatest artist activist of our generation um, and, and, and learn like about the power, you know, that that generational piece that Prentice talked about, you know, what we've been doing as black people with art and activism right down to the day where, you know, last week, you know, you had Kendrick Lamar you know, a uh, 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 drop an album called Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. And it was a lot of consciousness and, you know, um, brilliance being displayed in terms of how we use art to really speak to the times and, you know, bring people into different um, scenarios and areas. And so for me, I, I can't see, I, I really can't see activism or organizing without art. You know what I'm saying? It would be, it would be boring, it'd be dull, you know what I'm saying? But like, 
you know, so everything we do at One Hood, like we bring the art, we bring the culture. You mentioned it. We bring the food. We go out of food trucks, pull up. We had an event Saturday. We had the Jamaican food truck in the spot. You know what I mean? Like, and it's just like, that's how we, um, to me, you know, that brings the joy to the, to the movement. That brings the passion and that expression. And so it's really an extension of that resistance. Um, and it connects us to that history of what we've been doing when we were, you know, um, singing those songs of resistance, you know what I'm saying? Um, as we were planning our, our liberation and our freedom back in the day in, 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 in the South, and we're doing the same thing right now. And so um, to me, like I said, I, I don't see, I see it as intertwined. Like my art is an expression of the activism and the work that I do every day. Um, and so, you know, yeah, man, that's, that's, just, that's just Blackness. That's how we do it. I love it. I'm turning my camera off because my interwebs is a little bit player hating. Um, but I'm committed to doing whatever is necessary. Plus, does anybody need to see me? Okay, so my hand is cramping because I'm a note taker because you all are dropping so many gems. And I hope that our participants who are joining us I hope you're taking notes and thinking about those questions that you want to lift up in a bit. And before I get into like asking you all to kind of give us, you know, the CVS receipt of what your organizations are doing and just letting share, you know, you know, give yourself your flowers, pulling a Snoop Dogg. You know, I want to thank me for me. Um, before we get to that, <laughs> I know I'm unsupervised, so, you know, deal with it. I, I hear I heard something that each of you all like I can read it in your bios. I hear it in what you've shared. Um, and it's this notion of or what I'm curious of is this notion of how do you all navigate intergenerationality um, and understanding that particularly hip hop, I think, is kind of echoed out of all of you all's or surface out of all of the work that, that we're doing. And so folks can immediately say, oh, that's them young, that's those young folks, and then kind of unintentionally cancel the actual work that, 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 that folks are doing. So I wonder how you all approach how you're intentional around the, the notion of intergenerationality, um, either in the work you're doing or the necessity for us to be thinking intergenerationally around to affect change. So how do you all handle the intergenerational component of this work? I don't know if you want to go. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can kind of hop in because I think it's, um, I don't I don't necessarily think in those terms because I mean, I think I've had, we've had positive and negative, you know, um, stuff. When we, when we first started at One Hood, for instance, um, probably our biggest um, opposition was like established black leaders. And it was like a feeling of like, we were going to come up and either take shine or take resources. And I remember like, I was, I was kind of heartbroken in a sense of like, wow, like there were some folks that I thought were going to embrace us that didn't, but those, those elders that came to us and like mentored us and loved on us, you know, were those folks that came right out of that. So we had like both, you know what I'm saying? I think like, uh, to me, it's like if, if if you come and you're your authentic self, you're going to find and attract those elders. You know, when, when folks were saying like, oh, you know, black, uh, you know, I, I'll give an example, like Harry Belafonte sent me to Ferguson. I remember seeing what was happening in Ferguson, going to New York City, you know, meeting with um, uh, Mr. Belafonte and him saying at that time he couldn't go, but him sending myself and a young woman named Carmen Perez, who's the executive director of the Gathering for Justice to Ferguson and he was like, you know, identify, you know, people on the ground that I can support. And then, you know, eventually he went for himself. And so I think like with anything, like you're gonna find folks that are gonna be supportive. You, there are gonna be some folks that are like, oh, that's that hip hop, you know, they hear a curse word, they're gonna be, but then you're gonna find them folks that's like, yo, that's that hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Like Mr. Belafonte produced a, 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 a movie called Beat Street you know, early on that like, that was part of the hip hop generation. So you're going to find those, those elders that kind of see themselves and their movements and what we're doing 
and how that culture influenced them back then is influencing us right now. And so I think if you're, you know, your authentic self, you're genuine to what you believe and you're really doing the work in the community, folks are going to be, you know, they'll, they'll tolerate a little curse word and <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Maybe somebody twerking, whatever, whatever, because they know you're genuine and you're real. Um, and, and those that, you know, are don't, or maybe are afraid of whatever, whatever, you know, they're going to get moved out the way anyway. So it is what it is, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh man. You just said so much, right? Um, and I, I want to name that, um, the video that we watched in the beginning was shot in the, um, NAACP building um, in Mississippi, which was the office of Mega Evers, which is down the street from the building that is called the Council of Federated Organizations, the COFO Center, um, which is off of Lynch Street, which houses my alma mater, Jackson State University. Up and down that strip is history, blackness, and you can find an elder or two almost every day um, really to lean on and help guide um, the work that we're call calling this iteration of our movement. So I, I just wanted to name that because so many of my heroes, so many of the giants, I, I don't even like to say heroes because that dehumanizes people in some ways, but um, so many of the giants of our civil rights movement in Mississippi are still with us. And um, before we shot this video before we recorded anything we talked to brother hollis watkins um we talked to um a couple of folks who are still um uh, active in the naacp uh, we talked to mr frank figures we talked to folks right we just sat at their feet and learned from them um before we carved out our up to us campaign which is the 16 week uh gotv campaign that Dollar Black is mentioning throughout the video, um, we talk strategy <laughs> with uh, our elders. And I also want to name that there's some, there's a lot of complexities to that, right? Like I had to write a love letter to my elders because they were really upset, not just about um, some of the, some of the way that we portrayed um, our movement in that particular piece, but um, that piece came on the offset of us organizing, helping to organize young people to move um, into the streets um, in 2020 to demand the taking down of the Mississippi flag, the Confederate emblem that was still there. And so, you know, they wanted to be involved in a particular way. But one of the things that I was clear about was that, you know, there's a generation behind me that have taxed me with doing a thing and I'm gonna do the thing like they want me to do the thing. And I don't, I don't, I can't move you into the way that they wanna be moved, but I can say to you that you can, you have a seat next to me to advise me. And if you don't wanna be involved in that way, number one, being elder, being somebody's elder is a choice. Like we get to choose whether or not you might elder. Just cause you old, that doesn't give you merit, okay? Like, it's, it's a chosen position um, by the person who is deeming you as such. So um, shout out to Timothy Young and um, Taylor Turner, who are now on our staff, who have been, um, and Jerry's Adams, who were instrumental in building the intergenerational piece, um, and also like holding me accountable to the way that we get to involve elders and the way that I myself am involved in like how this next generation of organizers are seeing themselves as part of like this continuum. And so I think that it's complicated, but it's also like beautiful because we get to challenge ourselves and we get to challenge our elders to see past um, this kind of selfish nature that sometimes comes out <laughs> when, um, you know, the moment has passed. And I pray to the good Lord that like when my season is over, I'm giving the, man, the, the baton to somebody else and I'm preparing the next generation to, to be the next whoever, um, to be the next leader of Mississippi Vote. So I think if we continue to think like that, if we continue to move people into um, positions of power and positions where they're able to um, be creative and imaginative, 
we don't have to ever worry about being irrelevant <laughs> because they're going to always talk to us about, you know, what's next. And they're going to always seek guidance from us. Brother Hollis said something to a friend of mine a couple of years ago. He said, you can run as fast as you can around me. Just don't run over me. And um, if you notice in the video, there are a couple of times where he's there. There's a couple of times when Nashambi Lambright is uh, in that video, a picture of Mega Evers is there because we glean, we lean on that. We lean on that. We don't ever want to, um, um, forget where we've come from, but we also must move on, right? Um, and so I think that is the nature of our work and how we're trying to like beautifully struggle through how we get to next um, by also like respecting our, our, our history, respecting our land and respecting this new next generation of young organizers. And I'll be quick on this, but um, everything you all said is, is it, it, I, I encompass all of that as cultural art, artifact. You know, when I say, I say cultural artifact to be very specific, what we create does not only serve the purpose of the now, but it becomes our history. It becomes what we, what we go back to, a well in which we pull from. You know, you know, when I think about this question, I actually think a lot about the born free generation in South Africa, 20 years, 20 plus years post-apartheid. And if we were to look at that community of young people who never lived under the oppressive system of apartheid, but has all the remnants of it and have a whole nother hill to climb, they are literally living side by side with folks who lived in that, that time and are trying to wrestle with a new world together. Part of how that wrestling is very different in the US is that the US, we have amnesia. <laughs> we want to forget the things that have happened before, but what Black communities specifically, communities of color, but specifically Black communities have done is create rituals for us not to forget what we've been through and where we're going. So for the Gen Zs and the millennials, who I would say are the generation that's trying to reimagine what the next legacy of our civil rights, of what a multiracial democracy could look like in this country, they are pulling upon the cultural artifacts that have been left behind the songs. Hip hop to me, it's a cultural artifact of the civil rights movement. It is created intentionally to be a roadmap to freedom for us to pull from the well from. Absolutely. We have to remember that. And so while how the manifestation of it will look different with younger people now, because we live in a different world, it is actually an honor that we are sampling, literally sampling in music, but pulling back all the things that we've learned that has gotten us here. What we have to be able to do is that we have to, we have to be able to allow for different types of people to come to the table as they are, but not leave them there. We gotta let them come to the table as they are, but, and then take them on a journey to where we need to go next. And I think that our younger generation is pushing us the, the most around that. And it's up to our older generations of folks to steward that process too, you know? And I'm excited because I think we're on that journey together. Oh my goodness. Ashe and amen, amen and Ashe to all of that. Um, I wanna, mm, this is so good. Oh my goodness, look, time is just moving. Okay, um, so before y'all drop receipts, I gotta just add one more because I've encountered this and something you said just seriously around the joy. Um, and it's something you said, uh, um, Arika, around you can't really move without art. And then Princess, you were like, you know, how, how why do we stop singing in the movements? And so I would love for you all to briefly, you know, give your dope, this PSA, drop the mic, pivot and walk away, um, bars, one liner or three on why joy is, is actually essential to this activism work, particularly because we're incorporating the arts, right? Like, so I show up at a rally when I know that a rally is not a protest. I just want to put that out for people. A rally is a gathering. Protest is an action that is followed through and strategic to affect some larger change. So I just want to just drop that 
in, in people's mental chats. Okay, so when I show up at a rally, that's because something innate in me needs to gather and be communal. And I am a dancer. That is my first language. And we need to move. We need to two-step. Yes, twerk is ancestral. It is liberation. The two-step, the snake, the duggy, the running man, just stomping and clapping our feet goes back to those traditions of the ring shout, of ciphering, of all of it. And so, so I, I saw on social media, and this is why sometimes, you know, you got to like be on social media without being in social media. <laughs> okay. I saw that some, some people were like, all oh, that dancing, y'all missing a point. And I'm like, the joy and the art is on the same, is in the same it's on the other side of the coin. So if can you all just drop your experience, how the joy is part of this work that you all are doing? I could be real quick on it. This is why I think about every time I think about joy, specifically Black joy. Black joy is the antithesis to the stripping, the daily stripping of our agency and dignity. It reminds us that we can exist and thrive without conditions. And that is transformational, but it is fundamentally dis um, disruptive to a world that actually thrives through the stripping of that agency and dignity. That's why it's so important and so dangerous to people who don't wanna see that happen. What are we gonna say after that? <laughs> yeah. Cosign. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah. Let me mute this one. We just let the mic drop for that. We let it sit, let people feel that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. It's true. Mm -hmm. We, mm -hmm. can't, we cannot live in a world where agency is stripped and dignity is not experienced. That's why artists are so powerful because so often artists are rediscovering themselves through their art first. That is a human condition that so many people don't actually get. That's why they, they actually get to discover their power and their source so much faster because they go within and find it. Then there's the reintegration. So how do you want to take that into the public life and transform others? and remind people that they have that well inside themselves. That's what's so powerful about it. You can tell Prentice got Mississippi roots. He just preached a sermon, okay? I was like, is it Wednesday? Let me get my church okay. fan. Because, okay. um, right. you know, that was a whole word. It, it's also something unifying. Like, when you put that song on that, like, everybody know, and everybody's like, that's that. And it's like, we all react at the same time. Like, that's that jam and move. It's just a unifying power that art brings and culture brings to the to the vibe man where you don't even have to say a word you hear them first little thing you know dun, 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 all smile life, my life I, I, had to fight. <laughs> I mean then we all we all moving you know what i'm saying from whatever part of the country you in north south east west we rocking and so that's just that unifying power you know that 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 culture hip-hop brings you know it's beautiful I recall being in the streets in 2020 and we had a DJ um, after one of our um, protests and he started playing. I don't know if you all know the song, but it goes. Okay. So it was playing and all of the girls, all of the girls were in the street and we like, I don't know what it was about that moment, but like we took some joy back. We took some of, we took our power back in that moment. We we're in front of the governor's mansion demanding a thing, but we were also saying, and also this twerk you are gonna get. So there's something powerful about the way that black people have always, black, black people always um, have resisted and and told, told the state no and told, um, everybody around us that we're going to exist and our existence, our being is the resistance. Come on. Listen, church is in my last name and it's Wednesday. So I thought I was going to be the one. Um, we about to get ready to pass the collection plate on tonight. Saints and friends, friends and saints. Um, 
I, just, I, I really, you know, I think it's so important and you all have laid this out so beautifully and, and the word that's coming to my mind is Sankofa, right? And so we have to reverence what's in the soil so that we can make sure we're going to cultivate this thing that is springing forward and where it's headed, right? And so there is no tradition of being without art, without a stomp clap, a hmm, a well, a sway, a call and response. And so I think people forget that the struggle for rights does not mean that we have to be weary at all times. That sometimes you do have to twerk it out, one leg, one jump. Sometimes you got to back it up. Sometimes it is just literally being shoulder to shoulder so that that human connection can be made so that we know I got you. And when you don't got you, I know what's going to get us, right? So I just really think it's important to lift that up because I think it goes unsaid too often. And I also think that particularly as Black folks, as folks of color who come from traditions of, of music, of rhythm, of rhyming, of call and response, I think we have to remind literally the like if we get into the etymology of remind mind ourselves again around the importance of having a sensorial embodied full experience of the work and that means joy as well. So um as we as we cut to close I'm going to um just ask folks I know we have one question in the in the chat and I know you all have a uh, so much that you've done if you've mentioned some of your accomplishments I'm going to encourage everybody to do your good interweb, YouTube University, Google scholarship diligence and look them up. Um, but could you all quickly just, um, I think I'm looking, we have a question and I think this links to like how to wrap it up before we, before we close close is around people wanna get engaged with like know the first step. So can some, maybe will somebody share like a first step to encourage young people? We have a young person who's like, they wanna be engaged um, using art and getting involved in, in civic action. So what are some, what's something that you can offer young folks who want to be like, I want to do it? Okay. Um, find your people, find a political home. Um, more and more that is becoming important to, um, a lot of young folks that I work with is just to find a place and a space where you can be imaginative, um, be loud and right, be loud and wrong and explore the nuance in between. Um, and I also don't think that there is, um, I think the way that I'm reading the question is that um, when I get older, you don't have to wait till you get older. Right now is the moment. And if something, if, if you want to be involved in something like what we're all a part of and it doesn't exist where you are, um, I think each of us is willing to help you start something <laughs> that you want to exist, that you want to see. So um, it's all super possible. And yeah. And then one other thing I'll just add is like, as you're finding your people, tell your story. You already got a story. Make sure you go out there and tell your story full of agency. Know that you are already worthy, dignified in all those ways. And because you are divinely ordered on this planet, in this democracy, you can get what you need with other people. So you should do that. And create. Whatever that creation is for you, rather it's writing, rather it's singing, maybe it's dancing, any of those things create. And that will, that will help you tap into that well, especially as a young person, to figure out what's the best contribution you could bring to this world, because the world needs your contribution. Absolutely. And, I, and I'll just add, you know, you're going to stumble, you're going to slip up, like, don't let, sometimes I feel like sometimes people let fear of making a mistake or, you know, it like stop them, like, hey, look, all of us you know, have made mistakes, slipped up, had to been corrected, had to be pulled in, had to have somebody throw the arm over the shoulder. Like, and so like, don't let that stop you. You go make mistakes. It's okay. As long as you're willing to be corrected and you're willing to, you know, move forward with your community at heart. So 
do it. Don't be afraid. Go out and get it done. Get it done. Can't stop, won't stop, right? Just to take a page from the whole like hip hop. Low key, that's the hip hop mantra, right? Can't stop, won't stop. Um, so speaking of create, doing it, don't be afraid. Um, I want to pass the mic to the formerly retired uh, rapper. <laughs> Ah, you Jay Z us. You Jay Z <laughs> come back for the black album and bless us with just a little live taste Absolutely. of the of the blend of, of art and activism to so, Thanks. So just to put this in context, I, I live in a, a, a former a formerly black community called East Liberty, um, an historically black community in Pittsburgh that's been rapidly gentrified. We have one of the, I guess, most profitable Whole Foods. So they're building like a larger whole foods that people can live on and they took down you know projects went down the target went up you know um and so this is just my commentary on my neighborhood and what i see happening so um my hood went from project dope things and hustlers to condos and coffee shops filled with customers niggas in white trash to hipsters and bike paths no life raft who knew my hood came with a price tag? In nights past, to walk the block, you had to have the right rag. Now police lights flash if you glance at a white ass. Better keep it moving, keep assuming it's your hood. We were sleeping when they moved and now we losing it for good. We was banging and shooting, looting everything we could. Now they building institutions on them corners that we stood. Tenements that we was living in, they demolition them for multi-million dollar businesses and we can't even sit in them. And if you want a job, slim chance you getting it. Wages a minimum, part-time with no benefits. East Lib was our Harlem vendors bartering and flipping it. Now it's like our Harlem because we can't afford to live in it. The economy of poverty, neck bones and collard greens, needles that swallow fiends and strong arm robberies, colonies, scratch off lotteries, no apologies, idolatry. We find God wherever them dollars be, ironically, because we got the least of the leases. So we diamond flooded the Jesus pieces just to believe it. It's egregious. You can tell the priests and the priests we leasing and the new Jordans just to look decent. The precinct is right down the block. We sold in front of it. Ignored for the last 50 years by city government. Until the rich developers came and said they wanted it. Money was budgeted and suddenly it was flooded with them gentrifiers. They skin is whiter, the rent is higher. Bidding by the crib and put it behind us some chicken wire. No set flagging, no liquor stores, a check casting, just a sign stuck to your front door. No trespassing. So dedicated to my neighborhood, East Liberty, Pittsburgh, y'all. Come on, spit that fire. <laughs> fire. Um, so, you know, the doors of the church are now open. Um, I just, I'm going to pass it back to Ryan to do a formal thank you. I want to say to Arika, Jasiri and Princess, thank you for blessing me. And I look forward to staying in community and connection with you all. Thank you. Let, right, like shout out to Aisha one second, because like you did the thing yes. with the so yeah. That's Black queen, all over you. <laughs> Period. I see you. I see you. <laughs> I just want to thank you all for such an inspiring hour. Thank you, Asia, for incredible moderation. Really amazing. Arika, Prentice, Jasiri, thank you. Jasiri, thank you for wrapping us up with that performance. Incredible. Thank you all. I also want to thank Tova and Melissa at the Ash Center for bringing this extraordinary group together. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Thank you in the audience for joining us this evening. Good night, everyone.